Hello everybody, this is Chris Attic with the Veterans Law Blog. So I want to welcome you to the month of December. Uh, hard to believe that it's already December. Um, this last uh, week the weather here in Little Rock's been gorgeous. You can see a little bit of it uh, behind me. I had a beautiful sunny day and, and if only I could have smelled the uh, salt water I would have thought I was in San Diego. The weather here was so nice. So hard to believe we're in the month of December. Hard to believe 2016 is almost in the books. Um, but in any event, here we are first week of December. Um, for those of you that don't know me or that may be joining for the first time, my name is Chris Attig and I am the author of the Veterans Law Blog. And the Veterans Law Blog, um, let me, I just might have made sure the video there is pretty good. So um, we're going to be spending an hour here. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a beer, whatever it is that you drink at uh, 3 o'clock uh, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, sit back and let's chat a little bit. Um, but the Veterans Law Blog is... Uh, different from anything you've ever seen before, frankly. Um, I don't know of anything else out there that does what the Veterans Law Blog is doing. Um, I, it started, I'm a veteran myself. I served in the Army from 1993 to 2004. Uh, I was U.S. Army and I was field artillery. I got out, I graduated at law school and went and became a lawyer. Uh, I filed my own VA claim in 2007 and realized that there's really nothing out there that teaches folks how to do this sort of stuff. Um, we could go out at the time, it, the law just changed, you could hire an attorney earlier in the appeal process. You could go out and work with a VSO, uh, roll the dice, uh, whether you've got a really good one or a really bad one. And there are some really good ones out there, uh, but those were pretty much your choices. If you wanted to do your claim on your own, um, or if you wanted to learn something to keep an eye on a VSO or keep an eye on an attorney, many of whom were at the time very new to this practice area, um, there were no resources out there, and I realized that and started working with some veterans through back in 2007. It was a, uh, an email listserv. I uh, started teaching them the VA claims process as I knew it uh, and as I experienced it. Every time I learned something in my own claim or every time I learned something in one of my cases, I would share it with this listserv. Well, these veterans started having some huge success in their claims. They started telling me about it. Um, and so I started writing a blog shortly after that. And the blog uh, then became, a few years later, it grew and grew and grew and became ebooks and videos, uh, teaching more in-depth information. And now it's grown to this, this massive site. I was looking at the, the numbers. We've got something north of 67,000 folks uh, following the Veterans Law Blog on Facebook. Um, I have over almost 200,000 uh, page views each month this year. So this is a pretty substantial undertaking. Um, the Veterans Law Blog has thousands of posts, written posts, um, dozens of video posts, video training, video guides, uh, ebooks. We're starting webinars here in a couple of weeks teaching veterans how to navigate the VA claims process. My goal is to make this the best resource for veterans battling the VA because, frankly, there's nothing else out there uh, that teaches you the claims and appeals process as it exists today, when it changes. There's nothing better out there. My goal is to make this the best. Uh, in order to do that, uh, the Veterans Law Blog is member supported. Uh, I told you those numbers about how big this blog has gotten, um, and, and that comes at a cost. Uh, certainly, hosting all this stuff, all this content, content delivery networks, video recordings, webinar services, all these different things uh, cost a lot of money to be, to be able to do them and to offer them in a way uh, that you guys can have the quick access uh, that you need. And so those costs keep going up. So the only way that we can do this and keep this thing going uh, is through member support. Um, you can go on the Veterans Law Blog and look at an annual or a monthly membership. Uh, join for a month if you want. You, you Join for a year if you want. And whatever way you go, you're going to get the first seven days free. So you don't like it. It's not what you're looking for. Go ahead and cancel and, and your credit card or your debit card or PayPal won't get charged. Um, so you've got seven free days to look around. Uh, and, and get uh, comfortable with the Veterans Law Blog. You're going to get access to thousands of posts, a searchable database. You're going to get uh, a 15% discount on any purchase at the Veterans Law Blog shop. So, um, and members, premium members, get opportunities to join our webinars. We're starting our first webinar in two weeks, and then we're going to have one probably each month, if not more frequently after that. And premium members get opportunities to jump in those absolutely free. So, um, in any event, I don't want to sit here and talk about the blog the whole time, but I do want to mention that for the folks that are joining, what the blog is about, what, what it does, um, and, and why we're here, so that you understand that I've been at this quite a while, uh, and there's a lot of folks out there uh, that are benefiting from this information. If you're not, let me know so that I can make it better. I need your feedback. I need your experiences uh, so that I can find ways to make things better. If you know of a company that wants to advertise on the Veterans Law Blog, that would really help me in offsetting some of these costs and be able to reduce those memberships. Uh, we have one company that does do a sponsorship. 
Uh, it's called Endorphin Warriors, uh, and they make custom uh, custom jewelry for um, endurance athletes that have single word motivation things. So you can look on the blog, click through their link. Um, some of their products, I'll, I'll show them to you. I actually ordered a ring for myself, but um, some of their products that make great Christmas gifts, great holiday gifts. Uh, take a look. If you go on the blog, you will see it on the right-hand column, and I will make sure to uh, put a link to them in the show notes. And if you would please support our sponsors, it helps me to reduce costs uh, for the memberships, or at least to keep them low while everybody else is raising costs. I just got a bill from one of our vendors um, that I was surprised at. So we're, we're going to have to Um, deal with that at some point. Anyway, enough talking about the business stuff. What I want to talk to you about is um, what we normally do every Friday here on Facebook. Um, So the first thing that we're going to do, I'm going to run through some news, some recent developments, catch you up on some things that affect veterans, mostly in the VA benefits area. Uh, And then we're going to jump into this week's main topic where I'm going to go in depth on a particular topic and talk to you about it. Um, This week we're talking about claims files, uh, what they are, how to get them, how to use them. Um, And then I'm going to answer some of the questions that you all have submitted. So at the very end, I'm going to give you coupon codes that are good for purchases on the blog uh, through next week. I'll tell you what they are. you got to stick all the way through them to get those coupon codes, though. Um, But they'll be in the show notes as well. So if you're watching this video and it's not live, just scroll to the bottom of the show notes and you'll see the coupon codes to get discounts uh, that are good through, I think, December 8th. Um, But I'm going to take questions that y'all have sent in, I'm going to answer them in depth, and I'm going to share that information with you. Um, Once we get all done, I'm going to post this, I'm going to have show notes. If I mention a blog post, if I mention a book, if I mention a website, you will find that in the very first comment um, underneath this Facebook post. And next week, uh, when I have the opportunity to put this up on Monday morning, I will put this up on the blog so that premium members can have uh, forever access to it, too, if they are not on uh, Facebook. And underneath that video will be the um, any of the links that I mentioned in this video. So let's just jump right in here, um, talk to you about news. So a couple of weeks ago, um, actually it was more like a month or so ago, I talked to you about the California Guard situation. Um, and most of you are familiar with that. What happened was um, some National Guard uh, service members in California um, were offered enlistment bonuses, re-enlistment bonuses. They re-enlisted. Many of them went overseas uh, to Iraq or Afghanistan. Many of them got injured. Some of them did not come back, back home. Um, but they were given these bonuses, and when they got back, the Department of Defense decided that they weren't eligible for them and started clawing them back, uh, putting a lot of veterans in a real financial hardship. Um, and, and some of the stories read were just, just heartbreaking, you know, veterans that were losing their homes over this sort of stuff. Um, but in any event, recent development, um, Congress today and then again on Monday are going to be voting on a defense uh, bill. And in that defense bill um, is an act that was going to do three things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to stop the DOD from collecting um, any of those enlistment bonuses unless the DOD can prove that the Guard member had actual knowledge that they weren't eligible. So uh, that's a pretty high hurdle, and I don't think the Department of Defense is going to be able to prove that in many of these cases, since most of these uh, reenlistment folks, uh, folks doing this reenlistment were misled. But they're also required to report to credit reporting agencies. They're required to pay back, according to this bill, which has not yet become law. They're going to be required to pay back anybody who has paid the Department of Defense for those enlistment bonuses, so some veterans will be seeing um, some of their money back. And it comes up for vote in the U.S. House today. I'm not sure exactly what time where this is all over. I'm going to get down and look and see if they voted on it. If it passes the House, uh, we all know from our you know grade school days that the next place that a bill has to go to become a law is it's got to go to the Senate. Uh, and if the Senate votes to approve it, Um, not this particular thing, but the entire defense bill, uh, then it's going to go to the president's desk, and all indicators are that it's going to pass. It's a must-pass defense budget, Um, and so all indicators are that it's going through, uh, and I believe the president has committed to signing it already. So if we can just get it through the House and the Senate the next couple of days, going to get some relief to those California National Guard members. Um, Speaking of Congress, the second piece of news I want to tell you about, uh, and this is real recent within the last 48 hours, Um, The the House of Representatives has announced who will be the new chair of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, The House Veterans Affairs Committee is a group of uh, congressional representatives uh, that have oversight over the VA. Um, Bottom line, this is a powerful, powerful committee. Um, They have access 
to control the purse strings to the VA. And, and if used properly, um, they could really effectuate some significant change at the VA. And the chairman of that committee has a substantial amount of power. So for years and years and years, it's been Jeff Miller. Jeff Miller is one of the names that's being floated around as a possible secretary of the VA. I, I don't know. I, 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 like, I like him. He's a decent man. He's done some good things, but I just don't think that he's right for the secretary of the VA. That said, we've got a new chair to take his place because he's leaving Congress after this term. Phil Rowe, who is a congressman from Tennessee, uh, will take over as the chairman. So he is an Army veteran. Uh, he's also a doctor. Um, I will have links to his, first of all, to his press release so that you can read about him. I will also have links to his um, legislative agenda that he's already published, what he wants to do as the House Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, I'm, I'll tell you real quick, I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, it's kind of more of the same. Um, he's talking about the VA Choice Program, the Veterans Choice Program, uh, or as some of you know it, the Veterans No Choice Program. Um, this is a law that theoretically gives those veterans that have waited for more than 30 days in, for an appointment or who live more than 40 miles away from a VA medical facility the choice to seek VA-funded care outside of the VA system. Many of you know um, the problems with that. He wants to improve that program. I, I don't know why you want to um, fix a broken window like that. Um, especially when the, the, the window is, is not made out of glass. Um, not the best metaphor here. It's been a long week. I had a huge brief I was writing, so my, my jokes are going to really stink today. Uh, but in any event, he also wants to get the uh, SES firing authority. Um, this has been something that the Congress has been trying to do. They've been trying to say that these senior execs at the VA uh, should be able to get fired without benefits, without due process rights. And, you know, frankly, they're just never going to get around the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees everybody a uh, right to due process uh, and a constitutionally protected right, which is a federal government job. When you have that job and you have a certain amount of time in it, um, you get that due process right. So all this reform of the SES uh, program to try to give the VA, you know, on-the-spot firing power, it, it's not going to fix anything. It's First of all, it's not going to fly, but it's not going to fix anything. So We've been trying to do that for, for almost a decade now, and it's just not going to change. Um, he, here's something he does want to do, a National Desert Storm and Desert Shield War Memorial uh, Act to commemorate those two operations. And he also serves on the Invisible Wounds uh, Caucus, uh, which takes a look at some of the issues that are affecting Iraq and Afghanistan veterans to try to get out ahead of them. So uh, those are two good things. Uh, he also wants to work on coordinating health records delivery between defense and the VA. Again, we've been at that since before Shinseki, um, going all the way back to some of the early days, some of the first vets that came back from Iraq and Afghanistan when we recognized this problem. So nothing new here. Um, frankly, it's disappointing because that position controls the purse strings at the VA, and they could throttle the VA's money in exchange for doing things that would actually help veterans. Things like, how about a reintegration boot camp so that we get reverse boot camp when we leave the military to learn how to live in a civilian world? How about simplification of this benefits process so it's not this convoluted jibberty jabberty nonsense that you got to do all these, jump through all these hoops and file this and file this and serve this and send this and mail this and all that nonsense that goes on for three, four, five, eight, ten years. Let's make it simple. We can really make it simple and easy. How about expanding the Veterans Court? How about adding some more judges, giving them a courthouse for the love of God? Um, these folks have to go around the country from law school to law school borrowing courthouses because nobody's authorized them the money to do that. Uh, I don't agree with all the decisions that come out of the Veterans Court, but by God, they deserve a courthouse. Let's give it to them. How about getting rid of the Board of Veterans Appeals? And I'm going to send you know, shockwaves to some of you who are at the VA uh, when you hear that, but I see no value anymore in the BVA. Um, it, it at one point was a Band-Aid that cleared out the backlog of appeals. Uh, at that point, you know, when it was first started, it was the highest authority. There was no court authority beyond it. Uh, and then the court uh, came along in the early 1980s uh, and had oversight. And since then, you know, 80 percent, I think they're the numbers, maybe 70 percent, you know, that's arguing over semantics right there, but 70 percent of board decisions that are appealed to the court get reversed, remanded, vacated, or set aside for some legal or factual error. You know, I don't know. The only people that can bat 300 and be successful are baseball players. You can't do that uh, if you're a, a, a lawyer or an attorney. You can't write decisions that are reversed 70% of the time and think that you're effective. In addition, we're waiting three, four, five, sometimes eight to 10 years uh, for a board hearing. We've got one vet. We got a 2006 docket date. 
2006, we got word that we got the date set back that far because that's when her appeal was first certified to the board, and she's not gotten the hearing. It's 10 years. 10 years. It's unbelievable. They could make that change. You could set it up so that veterans could have an optional enrollment in VA health care or in Medicare and at certain income levels can support uh, with premium assistance. So there's a lot of things that could be done to effectuate some real change at the VA. There's a lot of things that that House Veterans Affairs Committee could do that would really impact veterans. And what I'm uh, unfortunately seeing in the legislative agenda that's coming is kind of the same old, same old. Um, I hope that's not the case. I hope that I'm misreading the tea leaves, uh, and I will gladly eat crow if I am. Um, so we'll keep an eye on things. But in any event, those were the two big developments this week in uh, the VA land as it affects mostly uh, veterans' benefits. So um, in any event, I want to move on to today's main topic, and we're going to talk about claims files. Let me go ahead and make sure I've got a sound level that's working good. Hold on one second. All right, good deal. All right, um, in any event, we're going to talk about today's main topic, which is claims files. So a lot of you that follow the Veterans Law Blog or have followed it for any period of time uh, know that I harp on a couple of things. And I harp on certain topics that I think um, are really important to improving your VA claim or appeal. Uh, most of these things became, uh, you know, there's eight of them that became the eight steps to improve your VA claim or appeal because I noticed over the years of stuttering, studying veterans' claims files, say that ten times real quick, uh, stuttering, studying, <laughs> there I go again, I'm looking at these files and I'm seeing the patterns emerge. I'm seeing veterans doing the same things incorrectly. I'm seeing the VA messing things up the same way. I'm seeing veterans that have found ways around the mistakes that the VA is making. And so I started documenting all these patterns and developed the eight steps. The first step, the very first step to improve your VA disability claim is recognizing that you are the solution. So for years and years and years, we are all as veterans taught that we are helpless in this VA system, that the VA is there to take care of us, that it's a very non-adversarial system, it's a paternalistic system, and they're supposed to take care of us. Um, and then they tell us that they're backlogged and they can't get us our files, or they're backlogged and they can't get decisions, or they're backlogged and they can't set hearings, or they're backlogged and they can't get you into the damn doctor before you die, or they're backlogged and all this other nonsense happens. So you hear all that stuff and you start getting trained to believe that you have no power, that you have no ability to effectuate change in the VA. And I categorically reject that notion. There are things that we can do to take back the power to cut through the fog. And the very first step in improving your VA claim is realizing that. Now, it's not something that you just wake up the next morning and say, ah, I have the power now. It's something that over time you will realize. Uh, and that certainly I've realized with the hundreds uh, of veterans that I've represented and the hundreds and thousands of you guys uh, that I've seen use this knowledge uh, and that email me and say, hey, I just got 100% or hey, I just got special monthly comp or I got 70% in three months. Uh, I did all these things with this knowledge. So you do have power. That's the first step. The second step, and it's the main topic for today, is get your VA claims file. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning because a lot of you don't know what the claims file is. A lot of you don't know what the C file is, and that's fine. That's okay. That's why we're here is to give you this education, to give you this knowledge, because knowledge is, I used to say knowledge is power, um, but then I realized the power is what you think it is. Um, so knowledge is powerful, right? So I'm going to give you some knowledge here about C files. It stands for claims file. Theoretically, it is all the evidence that the VA has developed for and against your claims. And it's keeping it in a paper file up until recently where they started digitizing it. Uh, they're telling us that they've got 100% of these files scanned in and on CD uh, until it gets really difficult for them to hold their position. And then they're like, oh, we can't find the C file. It's on paper. It's only, only one left on paper. Uh, and they start making up that excuse. So we know they haven't scanned them all in. Some of your claims files are stacks of paper. Some of them are sitting in the bottom of a VA regional office about to get sent to get scanned in. And some of them have been scanned into a system uh, where, you know, in some cases your attorney can access it. Uh, in some cases they can't. It's a messed up system. But in theory, it's all the documents that the VA has gathered or developed to prove or disprove your claim, including claims forms, um, uh, statements, uh, medical records, anything that, that you've sent in, anything that they've developed privately. Or uh, privately is not the right word, but developed on their own. Um, 
A lot of veterans will ask me, what is the difference between a C file and my military service records? And there's a huge difference. So your military service records are your personnel records jacket. Each branch has a different name for what they call it. But your personnel record folder, when you leave active duty or leave the reserves or get your, your final discharge, um, you get a copy of those in theory. And then the originals are sent up to the National Personnel Records Center after a period of time and they're digitized there in theory. Um, and those are records that show where you served, when you served, what your MOS was, uh, that show, you know, the DD-214 is in there, um, the feeder forms for the 214, your personnel evaluations, your officer evaluations if you're an officer, your NCO evaluations if you're an NCO, travel vouchers in some case, uh, disciplinary records in a lot of cases, right? And in some cases, there are uh, some military service medical records that make it into that folder. That's at the National Personnel Records Center, which is in St. Louis, Missouri. And it's very different from your C file. One of the very first things that the VA is supposed to do in developing a claim uh, is to get a copy of your personnel records folder from uh, the MPRC. And they cherry pick what they want to put into your claims file from there. So not everything makes it in. So it's important that you realize that the VA doesn't even have your full personnel records folder, but the C file is different from that, is the point I'm trying to make. What is the difference between a C file and medical records that you have at the VA. And a lot of people say, oh, you just go down to the VA Medical Center and they'll print them out right on the spot for you and then you've got your C file. That ain't your C file, folks. Those are your VA medical records. If you are treated at the VA for any condition, dental, physical, mental, whatever the case may be, the VA keeps progress notes, they keep diagnostic reports, they keep test results, lab results, and all that stuff. Initially, they start out as handwritten reports and then those are then transcribed into their record keeping system and then they're collected at the VA Medical Center. And you can go into the VA Medical Center uh, in many cases and get within, you know, 24 hours they can print out depending on how much it is. I mean, sometimes we've had uh, veterans that I've worked with that have treatment records going back 30 years um, and, and they ain't printing that out overnight, I'll tell you that. But uh, and, and rightfully so, it's a lot of information. But many of you can go right in and get that. It is not your C file though. That is different. Sometimes the VA will go to its sister side on the health side uh, and ask for your medical treatment records. But again, they cherry pick what they put into your claims file. And now think about that. You've got some non-medically trained raters evaluating your case, deciding what medical records are or are not important, and they're putting them in your C file. And the rest of them, they're not. So again, it's not your C file. You're going to want to get your medical records, and you're going to bump them against each other. That's another topic for another day. Um, so a lot of folks say, well, what's the difference between my C file and e-benefits? Well, I don't know what the hell e-benefits is. I, I tell you, if I can pull this up right on my computer right now and show you my e-benefits account, if you log in, you will see that before I ever filed a VA claim, they held a BVA hearing. So I don't know what that is. I don't know how that happened. I wish I was invited because I would have loved to have heard about this uh, appeal that hadn't even been filed yet. Uh, but in any event, e-benefits, what it's good for is it's good for sending some information occasionally to the VA um, when it works. It's good for getting things like your certificates of eligibility. In some cases, you can download your health records uh, through e-benefits um, if it works. Um, if you want to get a VA home loan or, or find out if you're eligible for it, you can download that. It's a bit different style of communication with the VA, but it's not your actual C file. Your C file is all the evidence that the VA has developed in support of or against your claim that is maintained in a paper file at the regional office or that is maintained digitally in a system. There's actually like 19 of them, but right now the one that they're giving advocates access to is called the VBMS. Um, it's called the Veteran, Veterans Benefits Management System. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, frankly, I think it's the Veterans Bullshit Management System, but uh, I shouldn't be cussing on this video because God knows that's going to come back to haunt me someday. Um, so for all those folks at the VA that are working hard uh, on VBMS, I'm sorry, but at least I gave you a new acronym to work with. Uh, but in any event, if it's stored digitally, it's in VBMS in theory. So that's what a C file is. How do you get it? because it's, it's hugely important. Uh, we'll talk about how to get it in just a minute. Uh, what I want to talk to you about first is why it's important. Any stage of this process, from the very moment that a raider first looks at it, from the time that a compensation and pension examiner looks at it to determine if your condition is related to service, to the time a doctor looks at it to say that your condition equivalent, or is the equivalent of a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, whatever percent disability. 
to the time that you get a DRO hearing, a decision review officer hearing when your claim is denied, all the way up to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, the judges are looking at that when they deny it. When you file in the court, they take that C file and they send it as it existed at the time of your BVA decision. They send it to the court and they call it the record before the agency. So it then becomes a record in the court. Everybody, every single step of the process is looking at the C file and what's in it and what's not in it is driving your claim. So if you're getting bad results in your VA claim, 95% of the time it's because of what is or is not in your VA claims file. If you got good results from the VA, 95% of the time it's because of what you put in or what the VA got to put in for you or what the DAV or the Legion or the VFW or some advocate put in your C file for you, right? It's hugely important. Everybody at every step of the process. Now, I've seen veterans that have gotten their C file back and they have come and they've said, Chris, this is not my medical record. I'm not African-American uh, or I am not pregnant because I'm a guy. Um, and what they find is that there are other veterans' records. If you have a sibling with a similar name, if you have a child or a parent that served in the military with a similar name, there's a good chance that they're crossing up those uh, medical records and those C files. So get your C file to make sure. In fact, I'll tell you, there's a story I'm going to put in the show notes. A story about a veteran whose claim was denied by the BVA. And the BVA relied on stuff that was in the C file that had nothing to do with that veteran, had another guy's name right on it. And I don't know why. That's one of the reasons I say the BVA is just probably not relevant anymore um, because of mistakes like that. If they're working that hard to write that many decisions that quickly, I don't know what value they're adding to the system. But um, many of the judges are good people. I like a lot of the judges. Whether I like their decisions or not, they're still good people. So I don't mean to slam the people. Um, but making decisions like that affect veterans' benefits. And you probably, that veteran probably didn't know um, that some other veterans' records were being used to deny his claim. Um, so what you don't know about your claims file might be hurting you, okay? What you don't know about your VA claim could very well be hurting your claim. So that's, it's really hugely important. It's the most important document I see in a VA claim because when you get that thing, you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. So how do you get it? So there's three ways to go about getting your VAC file. The first way, um, you can go into a VA regional office and you can ask to take a look at it. Um, you're not gonna be able to leave the regional office with it because if they do have the paper there, it's going to be uh, the original, um, and so they're not going to let you walk out of the building with the original, although it's the VA, so they might. That's a horrible joke. I'm making some really big slams on the VA. Uh, I know I'm going to get a message from a Raider or a DRO or a BVA judge that's been watching this video uh, laying into me, and, and frankly, for some of these jokes, I deserve it. But in any event, um, you can go into the regional office, ask to take a look at it in, there, in the original paper if they have it, or in a digital form. You can't make a copy. You can't print stuff out. You've got to look at it there. So that's the first way. The second way, there's a form, um, a VA form, I don't know, a 79 or 2, whatever. Who knows? I don't even know what the number is. Um, but I know that there's a form that you can request your file. But I will tell you, I've been looking at these claims files since 2007. I look at, at probably a dozen of them a week um, over that time period. Um, I have never, ever, ever seen the VA provide a C file based on that form. Never seen it. Never seen it happen. Um, and they do document things like that. So when we use our process at my law firm to get it, they acknowledge the request. They acknowledge the receipt of the request. They acknowledge when they're going to send it. Um, and they should be doing the same thing for the other forms, but I've never seen any veteran who's ever gotten their C file with it. So I might be wrong about that, um, but it's another option that's out there. If you want to know what the form is, um, I will put the post that has that form and has these three methods in it into the show notes and you can look it up yourself and, and use that form and give it a try. Maybe it'll work. Um, who knows? Um, the third way is, is the way that I developed. I used to work for, years ago, I used to work for the IRS. Don't, don't tell anybody that. It's a stinking nasty business there. Um, man, I'm slamming the federal government today. Just slamming y'all. Um, but in any event, um, I used to work for the IRS and I used to see how people got information citizens got information out of the IRS and I took notes on that sort of stuff and then I applied it to my VA practice and came up with a process uh, that has real teeth. So when the VA comes back and says, oh, you got a backlog of claims files or oh my gosh, we're, we can't find it or oh my gosh, it's going to take 16 months to get you your C file. This process has a way that you can go and get a federal district court judge to order the VA to produce it. it has real teeth. You just got to follow the steps. 
So why is it important to have a process that has teeth like that? Because a lot of times, the VA does not want to do the work to get these files out. If you look at it, 21 million veterans, I think 4.5 million are presumed to be disabled or have a claim somewhere in the system. Um, if every one of those veterans asked for a copy of their C file, um, the VA would legitimately, in that case, have a backlog. There's just not enough manpower to do it. And so they don't necessarily jump at the opportunity to give you that claims file. Used to be in the days that it was at the regional office where these files existed, um, that there was a real conflict of interest. And the regional offices would take these requests for the C file and they'd kind of shove them under their desk drawer, throw them away, shred them. They would hold off on sending you that information because a lot of these big regional offices do have folks there that try to develop to deny the claims. They do have folks there that delay, delay, delay until you die. That's, that's a rare thing anymore. Uh, it happens a lot, but it's increasingly rare that that's happening. Um, and, and that's one of the, the, the issues that they don't want to give you your C file because you might make a better argument, frankly. Um, bottom line, you need a method that has real teeth to get that claims file out of the VA in a reasonable period of time. One of the things that they're telling folks right now, um, and this is anybody, if there's a lawyer watching this, you're going to see how silly this is. Um, we make Freedom of Information Act requests, basically is what the process is, um, to get the C file from the VA. And there's another act. So the FOIA basically says the government has to give you the records you request unless there's some exemption that allows them to not produce it. And the exemptions are things like national security. Uh, the exemptions are things like uh, uh, things that are the deliberative thought process of the government agency so that it doesn't put a chilling effect on decision-making processes. Um, there's stuff about mines that they're not allowed to release. I don't know. That was some lobby group got that one in there. But there's, I think, eight or nine different exceptions to the FOIA. One of them is that they are not able to give you information that is protected by the Privacy Act. And the Privacy Act says you cannot get my medical records under the FOIA. Or anyway, you cannot get my claims file unless I give you permission to do that. And that's what the Privacy Act says. But you can get your own medical records. You can get your own C file. You can get your own information from, from the government, and they can't use the Privacy Act to preclude the production of those records to you. But that's what they're doing right now. And some of you know that because you've written me about it, and you're like, what on earth do I do? I don't even understand what this means. All right, that's where you need this process with real teeth that's going to come in and tell the VA, you're, you're misreading the law. Privacy Act is not a defense against a FOIA request. Now, a lot of that's just legalese right there, um, but I'm going to teach the method. I've got a webinar coming up December 16th, uh, doing a live webinar. It's going to be 90 minutes, teaching veterans how to get their C file, um, and we're going to go a step beyond that uh, in those 90 minutes. I'm not only am I going to give you all the forms. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm going to show you how to use them. All right, These are real simple-to-use forms, really fill-in-the-blank kind of stuff. Um, that you can take, print out, fax into the VA, that you can email in, um, or that you can mail in. I'm sorry, not email. I don't know why I said email. But you can mail them in certified mail if you want to do it that way. Um, I am going to also spend a significant amount of time in that webinar teaching you the really, really, really important thing, which is what on earth do you do with your C file when you get it? Okay? Because that's what a lot of you have asked. You know, you've gotten your C file. You've gotten three or 4,000 pages of documents from the VA, and you're like, what do I do with this mountain of paper? How do I organize it? What do I do with it? Uh, and that's a great question, and I'm going to share with you everything that I've learned over the last nine years about how to do that. Because what I've learned is that there's several ways that you can look at this claims file. You can look at it chronologically from start to finish and see the life of your claim and start identifying where the big gaps are, and then where you can look at the action right before the gap and see what caused it. And so you can start predicting what's going to cause problems, and why. You can take and you can sort that file and you can look at it by medical condition. And so you can say, all right, I've got a claim for sleep apnea and that keeps getting denied. I'm going to sort all this stuff out based on all the four pillars of the sleep apnea claim, you know, eligibility, service connection, impairment rating, and effective date. I'm going to put all the evidence in those four stacks and I'm going to see why it is that they're denying it. Because their decisions are often very vague and cryptic that just say, uh, we were unable to verify that your injury was related to your military service. Well, you put in tons of evidence that you thought proved that, and all they do is say, well, we couldn't figure it out. Sorry. So when you sort your claims file 
by the four elements of that claim, you will start to see very quickly um, why they're having difficulty with a certain element, and you'll be able to repair that, right? And I'm also going to show you how to break it down in a couple of other ways that you can look at it to streamline your case and to start finding uh, ways around some of the VA walls. So there's three ways around a wall. If the VA puts a wall up, there's three ways. You can go over it, you can go under it, or you can go through it, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how that claims file, you can lay it all the way out and see the life of the claim, and you can start seeing where the walls are. And once you know where they are, you can go around them, go over them, you can go under them, you can go through them. There's actually four ways now that I think about it. But in any event, that's what I'm going to teach you. I'm going to give you something that I've never given to anybody outside of my law firm before. Uh, and it's the template that we use to organize the C file. And so, you know, it's a way of looking at it, it's a structured way that you can look at the claims file and identify exactly what's going on and break it down into those different ways without having to always go back and flip through and say, I remember this medical record. It's an index, it's an organization tool, and it really does make a difference. Um, I'll give you an example. We've got a, a vet uh, called me up. This is going back a few years. He called me up and his basically his deal was, I, I served in the Republic of Vietnam. I've got type 2 diabetes why is the VA denying my claim? All right, so to a lot of you that, that don't have claims in the Vietnam era may not know this, but if you can show to the VA that you had boots on the ground in the Republic of Vietnam, you are presumed exposed to Agent Orange. Once you show exposure, and they, they presume that if you have boots on the ground, right? They also presume that a list of conditions, one of which is diabetes, is caused by that Agent Orange, right? So if a Vietnam veteran that had boots on the ground in the Republic of Vietnam and a couple other places, um, there's some brown water claims and Thai vets and Korea vets that were exposed, but let's talk about those RVN ones. Um, if you can show boots on the ground and you develop one of these conditions, it's, it really is a no-brainer. Um, and the VA most of the time is getting those. So when this guy called me up and said, I, they're, they're denying me, I've been going back and forth with them for years and years and years, it didn't. It didn't add up to me that the VA really does get those out quick because it's so basic and simple. So I said, let's go ahead and pull your C file. So we got a C file, um, and I use this tool at my law firm to structure and organize this. And real quick, probably within 10 minutes of applying that method to it, figured out the problem uh, without having to sort through all 4,500 pages of that thing, was able to find the issue. Um, bottom line was that there was no evidence of a diagnosis of diabetes in the file. So I called him up. I'm like, listen, can you call your doctor and you have your doctor put down, I diagnosed my patient with type 2 diabetes on this date. Here's why. Here's the tests I did. Or just get those records from your doctor and put them on in. It was that simple. We've got another case uh, we got in at, at the law firm earlier, real recent, actually. It was earlier in the um, uh, fall. We got the case in, and it involves a, a, a blood disorder. And we use this template to break down the C file very quickly because it's a very extensive C file. Uh, and we're able to really quickly identify what the problem was. We picked up the phone. We talked to a decision review officer. Um, and because we had knowledge of what was in that C file, we could have an informed and educated discussion. And what it came out in the wash is she's like, listen, Chris, I'm ready to grant service connection because I see that he had this condition before service. I see that it got worse in service. I see that he's got a diagnosis of it now, but I have absolutely no way to see how bad this disorder is affecting him right now. And I can't order him for a comp and pen exam because it requires an invasive test that the VA is not going to allow a contract doctor to do. That, that's what I need. That's what's holding this whole thing up. Can you get me that? And so we're on the phone with getting folks set up to get this test, and we'll get that taken care of probably in just a, a couple of a weeks after the new year. Um, but the only reason we're able to know that is because we got the C file, and we use a special template that really quickly gets you down to brass tacks on this monster document. Those of you that know and have gotten it know that it's really hard to sit down with it and look through it. But in any event, um, I'm going to teach that in the webinar. It is um, on sale at the Veterans Law Blog. Go to veteranslawblog.org forward slash C file. Um, unfortunately, I do have to sell seats to it. Premium members got some free seats to it. Um, but I do have to sell them because webinars are very expensive. Um, I kept the price low until December 5th. So through Monday, December 5th, um, the price is, uh, I think it's 33% off or 30% off or something like that. And the price is going to jump. Uh, and that's because my costs go up as we add more people closer to the webinar. And so I don't want to, I'm not going to go in the hole on it. Um, but because it's our first webinar, I want to really understand. So get on there, get a seat, 
don't worry if you can't make it live to the webinar. Anybody that pays for a seat, even if you don't make it, you're going to get free access to the video. You're going to get free access to the forms. It'll be up in your account page. I think within 72 hours, we'll be able to have the video and all the forms up there, and you'll be able to keep it forever. Um, and we'll update it as things change. So you'll have that. Um, I want to encourage people to go live if they can because it, it increases the participation and, and makes it more beneficial for everybody. Uh, but I do understand that a lot of you are working and may not be able to. Um, so go ahead and, and pick up a seat. There's, there's not a whole lot left, so you might want to get on that, but the price is going to jump pretty significantly on Tuesday. Um, so let's see. What's the? Uh, that's basically it about C files. There's probably some more information. If you have more nuanced questions, um, go to the link that'll be in the show notes that talks about um, where you can submit your questions for the Facebook Live Q&A. Um, just hop on there, type in the question, and I'll see. I'll circle back around and, and get some more nuanced answers. Post them in the comments section down below, um, and then I'll be able to answer some of them when the video here is over. I'll get online and answer some of your questions. Um, in any event, let's jump into the actual questions that are sent in. And so the very first one, this was asked, asked several times uh, in different ways. But bottom line, the question is, and I think it's a great question because it's a fairly recent development in the VA, what is the Camp Lejeune registry and should I sign up? OK, so here's the deal. There are several registries at the VA. And the registries are meant, like the Agent Orange registry, the Camp Lejeune registry, there are the burn pit registries, okay? There's a lot of different registries. And what they are is they're saying, you as a veteran were likely exposed to this situation or likely have this condition. We're researching, we're developing knowledge about this, and we want to be able to give you flash alerts or quick information. So get on the registry and we'll be able to find you and track you down and get you that information. That way you know. And so the Agent Orange registry, anytime they add a new condition, everybody that's on this list gets a letter uh, letting them know that this has been added. Um, they also get a free medical exam, I think, with it, with Agent Orange Registry. I don't know. Maybe some of you guys can tell me. I don't know if they're still doing that. But there is now a registry for Camp Lejeune, military service red members that served at Camp Lejeune. And here's what happened. So rewind the clock. Go back, you know, to the post-World War II era when we were really ramping up in the war, well, the Cold War with the Soviets, and we were producing a lot of stuff. And we had this industrial machine that we built up for World War II that was just cranking out some serious uh, defense product. And we were using, at the same time, a lot of chemicals that we didn't really understand what they were at the time or what they did. Um, and so there are things like TCEs and PCEs and benzenes and vinyl chloride uh, and a whole bunch of really, really, really toxic chemicals. And they were using them for really goofy things like cleaning off engines on tanks or cleaning off the engines or, uh, of, of jet aircraft or doing various things. That, you know, when I was in law school, I had an opportunity to clerk for a law firm. Um, and I have to be very careful. I can't tell any of the actual parties in this because it was settled. Um, but I was clerking for a firm that represented a city in the southwest U.S. And that city was suing the federal government um, over a specific site where there had been an Air Force base. Uh, and that Air Force base had used these chemicals to hose off um, aircraft parts while they were cleaning them. And they leaked down into the water supply. Well, that water, that cloud, that plume of chemicals gets into the water supply and it started tainting the whole city. That's exactly what happened to Camp Lejeune. These TCEs, PCEs, uh, benzene, vinyl chloride, a whole bunch of others that, that I don't even uh, know if I can pronounce, um, got into the ground and they seeped down into the groundwater. So if you served at Camp Lejeune, between what are the time frames? August 1st of 1953 and December 31st of 1987. I don't really know how they picked those dates. I'm going to try to find out. Um, it seems like they just might have grabbed them out of the air and, and arbitrarily picked them. But if you served at Camp Lejeune during that time frame, whether an, on a duty assignment or even a TDY there, um, you likely were exposed to one of these chemicals by drinking the water there. So um, what's bad about that? Well, since about 1980, um, there's been uh, an increasing number of reports of service members, mostly Marines and their family members, that served at Camp Lejeune um, that are coming down with rates of these specific types of cancers um, that far exceed the military population and far exceed their, their peers in the civilian population. Um, there's a lot of spouses of military service members, Marines mostly, again, um, who were having children uh, with significant birth defects. And there's one 
a child. She was a nine-year-old girl. I, I'm going to mispronounce the name. I think it was Janie Ensminger, uh, if I remember correctly. Somebody correct me if I mispronounce that name. Um, but she was nine years old and died of cancer. Her, her father had served at Camp Lejeune for a significant portion of his career. Um, and she passed away at age nine, and he made it his mission to, to do something about this. And so he started pushing the Marine Corps, saying, listen, get in the groundwater, look at this stuff. There's poison in it. There's toxic chemicals. It's killing Marines. It's killing their families. It's giving them cancer. And nobody listened. The Marine Corps just kind of really just put their fingers in their ears. Um, all the way up until, I think it was 2009, um, when the uh, federal government got involved a little bit deeper and started looking around. They did two investigations. They did an investigation into the groundwater, and they also did an investigation into the non-responsiveness of the Marine Corps. By 2012, the, the first impact of that was in 2012 when President Obama signed the Janie Ensminger Act, uh, which gave some health benefits to some of the family members and service members that were exposed to the uh, contaminated drinking water. Uh, but then in 2014, I think it was, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, came out and said that the, uh, see if I get the actual numbers here, uh, the water at Camp Lejeune significantly increased the risk of multiple diseases, including liver and kidney cancer and ALS, uh, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, so earlier in 2016, based on that report, Secretary McDonald uh, issued some presumptive regulations. What does that mean? He issued a regulation or an order, basically, that said, if you can prove you served at certain uh, time frames at Camp Lejeune and you have a diagnosis of one of these conditions, I'll, I'll tell you what they are in a minute. If you have a diagnosis of them, we're going to presume that the two are related and we're going to service connect it. Um, unfortunately, and, and that's a huge thing, and I really want to compliment Secretary McDonald on, on the leadership that he, that he had getting that through. Um, he kind of gets a bad rap. I, I think he's probably one of the better secretaries of the VA we've ever had. I'm not going to say he's the best. I'm not 100% pleased with him. There's some things he could have done better, um, but I think he's one of the better ones that we've had uh, over the past, and I, 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 com I commend him on, on taking this action. Hopefully he does something for the Blue Water Navy vets uh, before he heads out. So, um, But in any event, it's going to apply to reservists. It applies to National Guard members. I'll put the link in there so that you can go onto the VA's website and see all the information. But let me read off the, the conditions to you. So adult leukemia, aplastic anemia or other myelodysplastic syndromes, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, liver cancer, multiple myelomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Parkinson's. If you have any one of those conditions and you served um, at Camp Lejeune, uh, during the dates of eligibility. I think they're the 57 to 83 dates or 53 to 87. Look them up on the site. Don't hold me to what I'm saying here. Um, then you're going to get service connected for that. Um, if you don't, if your condition is not on that list, you still have to prove direct exposure to groundwater that was contaminated. And that's really hard. It's really expensive to get onto Camp Lejeune, drill, do the testing to find the TC. Some of that stuff is out there in the public record so you can get it, um, but it's really challenging to prove. There's only a couple of law firms that are working with the, the Camp, Lejeune, uh, Camp, uh, Camp, Lejeune, Camp Lejeune victims uh, on the non-presumptives, all right? So if you need some help there, I might be able to get you in touch with some folks, but it's really hard because that's really expensive work, um, and not many people are doing that. Uh, but bottom line, if you have one of those conditions, get a claim in there. It's presumptive you'll get a service connected and you'll start being able to, to get that taken care of and at least have some benefits uh, from the VA that, that hopefully will pass on to your survivor um, if, if something uh, horrible should go wrong and that condition should um, uh, play a role in contributing to your death. Um, so I hate to, to be that crass and talk like that uh, in a video, but that's just the simple reality of this is, is some of these medical conditions um, do lead to death. Um, and it's important, uh, as you know, you'll see in my VA disability steps, the, one of the last steps is to protect your survivors um, because if you have certain ratings at certain times um, when you pass away uh, the, the spouse that depended on that stream of income from the VA compensation benefits uh, will see some of it replaced in the form of DIC and in some cases accrued benefits if you weren't able to prove it while you were living and, and that believe me I, I work with a lot of survivors uh, it makes a huge difference in their lives uh, a lot of them when when their veteran husband it, it, uh, most of the time um, the, the, the newest generation of veterans with, with a lot of uh, female vets passing and leaving a male spouse is, is not really percolated up yet. So a lot of male veterans die, and the spouse, who at that point is probably over 55 or 60, uh, isn't going to go back to school, 
isn't going to be able to get reestablished in the career, may not have worked for 20 or 30 years, but still has a household to take care of, still has a family to take care of in some cases, has grandchildren that they've adopted in a lot of situations, um, and they're left without income. And a lot of these folks end up on the streets, and a lot of these folks end up in, in, in shelters. Um, and so we work with a lot of these survivors, and when we are able to get them these benefits, survivor benefits, it makes a huge difference. Um, so if you're one of those vets out there that's not filing a claim for compensation because you don't want to take government money or whatever the reason is, think about the survivors that are after you and, and, and get that claim in there and maybe help them out down the road. But I kind of went off on a tangent there. That's a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart because uh, my, my grandmother was a surviving spouse of a World War II veteran, and she found herself in a situation with five kids to raise when, when my grandfather passed away because of a condition that he had uh, from the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. Uh, VA gave her the runaround. VSOs gave her the runaround. She never did get those benefits. Uh, we found out after she passed away that they would have changed her life dramatically. Uh, if back, you know, when he passed away, somebody could have sat down and given her a good scoop on it. Uh, but in any event, that's water under the bridge. And I want to move on to the next question. Hopefully that answered your question about the Camp Lejeune Registry. Um, let me know if you have any follow-up questions, and I'll see if I can hit them either in a blog post uh, or maybe we can touch on them in a future um, live cast here on Facebook. So the next question, um, and this is actually a direct question. I got this email, and normally I'm like, ah, I can't answer that question. But I'm going to take a stab at this one here because it's a common thing that happens. Before I do that, I'm going to go all Marco Rubio, Rubio on you and dip down here and get a uh, glass of water. All right, so in any event... Um, that goes back to the Republican primary debates. Um, some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, in any event, another horrible joke. Horrible joke. Um, second question. A veteran emailed this in, says, my appeal is taking too long. Should I just give up and start over? No. 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 Okay? That happens a lot. I see that happen a lot. And that's why I'm going to cover this question, because I see that in claims file a lot of the times. Listen. Unless you want to give up all your past due benefits or your earlier effective date, there's no point to withdrawing your claim. There's no point to withdrawing your appeal. Don't ever do it. There's actually only one legitimate reason, and I'm not talking about the court here, folks. When you get to the court, it's a different ball of wax up there. I'm talking about the board, and I'm talking about the VA regional office. If you do not believe anymore that your condition is related to military service, if you don't believe that, withdraw your claim. That's the only time you should. If you really truly believe that your claim is related, your condition is related to your military service, and somebody tells you to withdraw your claim or appeal to get some advantage somewhere in the system from somewhere, sirens should be going off. You should see bullshit falling from the sky because that's how horrible that advice is. Don't ever, ever withdraw a claim or appeal. Here's what's going to happen. Let me tell you. The veterans that are in this position, usually what they've done is they've gotten a VA ratings decision that denies benefit. They file a notice of disagreement, okay? So there's a year already. They talk to a decision review officer, six months, 12 months, 18 months. So we're looking at two and a half years, and they continue the denial. They send out a statement of the case. We're looking at three years. The, v the vet responds with a VA-9. You're looking at three and a half years. Then you sit in line at the board three to five years for a hearing. So you're looking at six to 11 years somewhere in there that you've been working on this claim, this denial of benefits, and you got to wait for this hearing, and some jerk tells you to withdraw your appeal and refile the claim and start over because it'll go quicker. Or they tell you to withdraw your appeal because that'll allow the VA to get back there and look at this other claim and they'll be able to grant it. And then they pull the carpet out and it's bait and switch. Don't ever withdraw your appeal. There's no point to it. There's no benefit from it. There's no value from it. And if you do do that in this situation, you've got six to 11 years invested in this. You withdraw your appeal and you go down to file a claim at the VA regional office. The first thing the VA is going to tell you is you withdrew that appeal and your claim is closed. It's done. So if you want to restart it, you've got to reopen it. So let's see new and material evidence to reopen your claim. Not to grant it, just to reopen consideration. So what you've just done by withdrawing your appeal is you've just created a situation where you've made more work for yourself to reopen the claim in the first place. And then if you're lucky enough to get it reopened, then you have to continue proving and you're starting all the way at the beginning. Now you may get the earlier effective date, but those six to 11 years you just invested, guess what? If you get it reopened, you're going to do it again. So you just doubled the wait time that you've got by withdrawing your appeal when all you had to do was sit in line at the board two to three years more, right? Or get on the Veterans Law Blog, look up Motion to Advance, 
and look at the four reasons that most veterans, particularly you veterans that are in the Vietnam era, most of you folks, and if you're experiencing financial hardship, if you're an Iraq or Afghanistan vet, if you're about to lose your home and become homeless, there's a whole host of reasons that will allow the board to advance your appeal on the docket, right? And get a hearing and a decision quicker. If you're over 70, it's actually the break says 75, but kind of the practice has been 70. If you're over that age, you can possibly get your appeal advanced on the docket. So get on there. I've got the forms. I've got the templates. You can look at it. You can download that stuff. Use them. Holler if you have any questions uh, about how to use them. But don't ever withdraw your appeal. I can't stress that enough. There are times when you're at the veterans court where you may withdraw a, a court appeal. And that's different um, because things that go on at the court level, um, if you continue to push a claim that doesn't have any merit, like I looked at one particular case a while back um, where no matter, there, there was clear error. The board clearly made an error. No argument about it. But when push came to shove, even if the court said they made an error, what's, what's, gonna, what's the resolution? Is there any benefit to the veteran? Well, we couldn't get any change. He was wanting an earlier effective date. And so that error, even if it was corrected, isn't going to give him an earlier effective date. So it's, it, the rule of prejudicial error came into play. And the veteran, it was best served by withdrawing that claim at that point because there's nothing he can do. He's not going to get anything. Uh, and, and that's something you want to do at the court level under the advice of an attorney, right? So an attorney can evaluate the risks. If some VSO tells you to withdraw your appeal or withdraw your claim to get some advantage in some other claim or to speed something else up or to get something done quicker, red lights should be flashing, sirens should be going off, and you should be thinking, I'm getting fed a line of nonsense here. So do not withdraw it. You might get all the way back to your earlier effective date, but you're going to have to do that whole wait all over again. In any event, next question. This is another real broad question that a veteran sent in. And normally, again, I don't consider these questions because they're so broad um, that, that I don't have any idea to answer them. But I'm going to take a stab at this one anyway. So the question usually starts out, do I have sufficient documentation to support my claim under appeal? Um, honestly, I, I have no idea. But my guess is no, no. So if you're on appeal, you do not have sufficient evidence in your claim because it got denied. So there's some reason it got denied. But neither here nor there. Take the logic out of it. Most veterans, most pro se veterans, and most VSOs, and frankly, a lot of the non-attorney advocates that are out there are not developing enough evidence, and they're not developing enough of the right evidence on appeals. And so my philosophy has always been that you put in as much evidence as you need to make it impossible or at the very least extremely difficult for the VA to deny it. They're going to have to really work. So that's how you make the, the distinction is put in evidence and put in a lot of it. Now, a lot of you hear that and then you immediately go out and you open up that file cabinet that's out in the garage that's got 6,000 pages of your military service and medical records and you put like 45 big binder clips and rubber bands on it and then you put it in a big banker's box and mail it off to the VA um, and they get all this paper and they scan it in and they still deny it and then you're like, Attic, you told me, put all this evidence in there. Well, here's the deal. Don't send the VA a haystack and yell at them when they can't find the needle. All right? So when I say put in a lot of evidence, I also mean to structure that evidence and to use an argument to help you structure and argue that case based on that evidence so that when you send in that haystack to the VA, the needle's right on top. Okay, So I show you how to do that in some cases on the Veterans Law Blog. There's a, a video on there called Get to the Point that'll teach you how to write a little bit better. I've got the VA Claims Evidence Field Manual that's going to walk you through some of the stuff I'm going to tell you about right here. Um, and that's on sale, I think, through the end of December. We're actually going to turn that uh, into a video training course here in the new year. Um, so that book's going to come down probably shortly after the new year. Um, maybe uh, as, as late as February. But in any event, uh, it's up there and it's on sale now. It's got some great information and I'm going to talk you through some of it right now. So bottom line, if you're trying to prove service connection, some of the things that you want in terms of evidence is evidence of a current disability, evidence of something that happened to you in the military, and evidence that relates the two together, right? And so you should have enough evidence to support each of those elements if service connection is what you're trying to prove. If you're trying to prove an increased rating or an entitlement to a higher rating, you're going to want 
medical evidence, you're going to want lay evidence that, and write these words down, that go through and explain the frequency, the chronicity, and the severity of your symptoms as they present and of the symptoms that are listed in the ratings table. So take a list, make a list of all the symptoms, and I teach you this in the VA Claims Evidence Field Manual, and we're going to do it in a full-length uh, webinar here in the new year. Um, I teach you how to do this. Go and pull down all of the symptoms off of the impairment ratings table, okay? Put those in column A on a piece of loose leaf paper or a piece of, you know, blank paper. All right, now write down all of your symptoms, whatever they are, even if they're the same, write down it and put them in another column. Then get online and pull up WebMD, pull up the Mayo Clinic, pull up some of these big, trusted and reliable medical sources of information and write down the symptoms that they have, okay? Now, get lay evidence on, if you have those symptoms, circle them, circle them, go all three columns, pull it down, and you're going to want medical evidence on those symptoms, or where you don't have medical evidence, you're going to want lay evidence, and that lay evidence should show frequency, chronicity, and severity of that symptom. So if your symptom, for example, let's say you're trying to get a higher rating for PTSD. Let's say you're trying to go from 50 to 70. One of the rating factors for 70 that's not in the 50 rating factor is um, impulse control issues. And so what you're going to want to do, if you're trying to document that, sometimes you're not going to have medical evidence necessarily of impulse control. It might be evidence in a medical record of you telling the doctor that or the doctor observing it as a result of some testing. Um, but normally you're not going to go into the VA and have an impulse control situation right there. Uh, if you do, it gets really bad. So where most of your evidence comes in for this is lay evidence. And you're going to want to get family members, co-workers, golfing buddies, hunting buddies, neighbor, boss, work colleague, aunts, uncles, cousins, anybody that sees you exhibiting those impulse control problems, and you're going to want to document, have them write down in an affidavit or a sworn declaration the frequency of the symptoms. Are they daily? Are they hourly? Are they weekly? Are they monthly? Are they annually? That's the frequency. Write down the chronicity, right? The chronicity is the sequence over time. So they're weekly for the last five years. That's the chronicity piece, right? It's important and then describe the severity. You really got to paint the picture with that severity piece. You can't just say, up, oh, it's severe impulse control. Really paint the picture. Um, and I talked to you about how to do this on the blog. There's um, uh, a good three-step post, a three-part post that talks about preparing for a comp and pen exam. And the last one in it is how to paint a picture for the CMP examiner so they really understand the severity of your symptoms. So that's what you're going to want to show in a rating in terms of evidence. There's three types of evidence. There's lay evidence, right? There's medical evidence, and there's medical expert evidence, all right? So let's walk through each of those real quick. Medical expert evidence is medical expert evidence. Say that 10 times real quick. I'm having real problems with words today. Medical experts usually draw the connection between the event that happened in service and your current disability, all right? And there's specific things that the expert needs to say, and that post is going to be in the show notes, okay? So read that post. Understand the two or three things that the expert needs to say to be reliable. All right? Medical evidence is stuff that's in your medical records. Go to the VA, go to your private doctors, get your medical records from military service. Lay evidence is, in, in, in short, everything else. It's statements from people, the list that I just gave you. It's your military personnel records. It's, in some situations, it's photographs. Uh, in some situations, it might be maps. Um, one thing, I did a post here uh, last week that talks about how to uh, make a connection between two conditions using a third connection our third condition, which was in that particular example, obesity. And so we put into evidence graphs uh, and charts of this veteran's weight and how it progressed and how the spike and the sudden increase in his weight, the hockey stick increase, occurred in the middle of his service. All right, so get on there and read about that post and see how you might use graphs and charts as evidence in your claim as lay evidence. All right, so those are the three types. The VA claims field manual is going to, evidence field manual is going to go through all that stuff in much more detail. Um, and then what kind of evidence. What sh you know, should that evidence be? And I say five-star evidence. Why do I say five-star? There's five checks that you should have on every piece of evidence that you send in the VA. And it's, it's, it's not that easy. This is the hardest part, frankly, um, because these terms are invented by lawyers 
to make themselves sound smart? I, I don't know. Uh, but your five stars of evidence have to be, and this is, goes into civil law, criminal law, VA claims. It's these same five factors that you're going to put in most evidence anyway. It's got to be material. It's got to be probative. It's got to be relevant. There's really no difference between relevant and probative when you get down to it, but there are some lawyers that will argue until they're dead um, 70 years from now um, that there's a difference between those two things. But in any event, the fourth one is the uh, evidence has to be competent and it has to be credible. And those have specific meanings. I cover it on the blog. I'm going to have some posts in there that explain what all those steps are. I go into depth in it in the VA claims evidence field manual. Um, but that's the bottom line. So real general answer to a real broad question, but hopefully it gives you guys uh, some insight. I tell you, if you take nothing else away from that lengthy snippet right there, um, it's for any rating that you're trying to prove, for any rating, whenever you're trying to get a rating, lay evidence of the frequency, chronicity, and severity of your symptoms, the ratings table symptoms, and any other symptoms from a credi pr credible medical source. Get them all down. Get as much lay evidence as you can from anybody that observes those symptoms. That's important, and not a lot of veterans do that. Not a lot of non-attorney advocates do it. And attorney advocates, we're trained. That's what we're, because we go to law school to learn that sort of thing. Um, but even still, um, we make judgments based on what we think is necessary to prove the claim. And so we make decisions and say, well, we're not going to put all of this evidence in. And I'm telling you a little bit different because I want you to put in enough evidence into your claim that it's going to make it, you're going to have to make a bureaucrat work to deny it. And once you flip the, the lid on them like that, and they've got to do work to deny it, it becomes easier to grant it, problem solved, right? It's hard for them to deny it, and they'll grant it. That's not 100% true. You never know what the VA is going to do. They're a fickle bureaucracy. Um, all right, last question, and then we're going to shut down. Um, wow, the sun is already setting here. This, you could watch the sunset in the back of this video, right? In any event, um, the last question. This is a great one. This actually came in right before... Uh, the live cast, and I wanted to hit it there. I forgot to write down the veteran's name that asked it, though. But the question is, is are allergic rhinitis and sleep apnea related? My answer is, could be. Could be. So what are those two conditions? Allergic rhinitis. Basically, you know, we used to, back in the day, we used to call it hay fever. Um, it's basically an allergy from the an airborne particle somewhere in the environment. So it's either, you know, a lot of times it's pet dander. Um, a lot of times it's pollen. Uh, for military veterans, particularly in the Iraq and Afghanistan era, it is particulate matter from the burn pits. So you burned all that crap over there, and every one of you knew that where those burn pits were. There wasn't a damn forward oper operating base over there. There wasn't a major base over there that didn't have a burn pit. And tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. But those burn pits, you, you saw the smoke coming up in the air. All that smoke right there, those are tiny little particles some of them, you know, as small as half a micron or, or way smaller than that, that comprise that smoke. And when you breathe that in, it blocks the air passages in your, in your, air, in your throat, uh, in your nasal passages. And that's the connection that you want to look for from allergic rhinitis to sleep apnea. There's three ways. Three. That's three. Come on, Chris. Work, work with me here. Get your numbers right. Um, in any event, uh, the first one, I'm going to read these off to you. Uh, nasal congestion is... When you have an exposure to the pollen or the particulate matter, whatever it is, it blocks the passage of air and it causes you to have congestion. And when that airflow is reduced, you increase the likelihood of apnea and hypopnea events when you're sleeping. All right? And that's what obstructive sleep apnea is. So that's one way that it's connected. Another way that it's connected is um, the, the particles themselves are blocking your airway, not just the congestion that results from it. And then a third way is a lot of times lack of treatment over a prolonged period of time is going to cause uh, pretty significant inflammation, which is causing the obstruction. And in some cases, some of the surgical treatments uh, for conditions uh, uh, related to the nose can cause scarring that results in uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So anything that blocks the passage of air from the nose or the mouth, if you're a mouth breather, all the way through you know, your throat, all the way down uh, into your lungs to the point where that oxygen crosses the, the, into the, the blood through the lungs, um, any obstruction, physical obstruction, any blockage of the air passage, anything 
due to a mechanical defect, if your back is out of alignment and it's throwing that out when you're sleeping, whatever it is, if your jaw is out of alignment, there's a million things it could be. Those are things you want to look at as causing sleep apnea because sleep apnea is a weird condition. Um, it, it doesn't just exist in a vacuum. Something always triggers it or causes it. Uh, there is one type that's, that's a uh, kind of a freestanding type of sleep apnea that's only recently being talked about. It's not a whole lot is known, and I'm not going to talk a lot about it uh, because I don't know a whole lot about it. I only read about it about a year and a half ago, um, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of information. But for the most part, sleep apnea is caused by another medical condition in most situations. So in those cases, you're going to need an expert to connect it. So if you have allergic rhinitis and you've got a sleep apnea diagnosis, your testimony is not going to connect those two things. You're going to need a medical expert to say that one caused the other, and you're going to need him to explain it. One of the biggest problems I see in y'all's experts' letters when I'm looking at your C files is that the expert letter basically says, you know, uh, dear VA, my client has allergic rhinitis. Uh, I diagnosed him with sleep apnea. The rhinitis caused sleep apnea. And that doctor is 100% right. I mean, the, they're not going to just make those diagnoses um, in a vacuum. They did testing. They did um, uh, over time, they probably did some rule out treatment to figure out if it was something else. Um, they've made decisions based on their diagnostic criteria that that's what you have. And that doctor needs to explain that to the VA. Because when they just see a two line letter, the VA's assumption is, well, that's not true because there's no explanation. Which is ironic because that's exactly what these comp and pen examiners do. Um, but not so ironic because if you look at the statistics coming out of the Court of Appeals and the board is that a lot of exams are getting kicked back for being inadequate um, because they make these conclusory statements. So don't make conclusory statements in your medical expert opinions like old math homework back in the day. Show your work. Have the doctor show the work. Enough to show that he or she did some testing, that he or she did uh, some evaluation, and some reason basis about why they came to the diagnosis. In any event... Um, also, if you developed, uh, well, we'll talk about that in a blog post. I'm going to save that for next week. In any event, um, listen, we've been going for an hour and 11 minutes, it looks like. So I am going to shut up and stop talking at this point. Um, I am not sure if there's anybody who is uh, enough of a, a VA claims warrior to have stuck with me for this entire time. Most of you, I guess, are popping in and out. Uh, but if you did stick with me the whole time, thank you. Enjoyed having you here. Um, listen, here are the coupon codes for the sales that start today and they go all the way through December the 8th. So the first one is, uh, first of all, the, the webinar, as I told you, for the C-Files is on sale, 33% off. That's going to end December 5th, and December 6th, it goes to full price, and that's just because uh, it becomes a little bit more costly for me um, to, to make some of the arrangements um, that late in the game. So um, also, if you want to get a uh, membership to the Veterans Law Blog from today through next Wednesday, uh, December 8th, you can get 15% off, either an annual or a monthly. And your coupon code is all small letters, member, M-E-M-B-E-R, all right? And that ends December 8th. Also, if you want to get a copy of the sleep apnea uh, package, it's eight eBooks uh, that go through pretty much all the information you're going to need to improve your sleep apnea claim. It's got the sleep apnea field manual. It's got the VA uh, claims evidence field manual. It's got uh, the five paths to service connection. It's got uh, the five reasons the VA is screwing up your claim and how you can fix it. It's got eight of these ebooks that are really powerful books. Um, if you want to get that, use coupon code uh, APNEA, A P N E A. This will all be in the show notes, uh, but use that coupon code at checkout and you'll get 10% off that through December 8th. So listen, thank you all for being here. Uh, look in the show notes for the link for where you can uh, pass on questions. To me, I do read all those questions and I select ones that are asked a lot so that we cover the most information for the most people. And then we'll see you next Friday, um, December, I guess, what is that? December the 9th. Um, so have a great weekend. Have a great week. Thanks for all of your support and thanks for all of the feedback that y'all give me. Uh, looking forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Bye.